be with you. I'm so glad that you've joined us for worship today at Leesburg Presbyterian Church. Whether you're a longtime member or a first-time visitor or someone who has just off and on been participating in our worship services here, we're so glad that you have found um, this time and this place, this moment, uh, a place for you to be in God's presence and to worship with the body of Christ. A couple of announcements. This coming Wednesday, we are trying our first outdoor worship, in-person outdoor worship. It is a BYOCC affair. Bring your own chair and your own communion, though we will have some extra chairs if that's difficult for some of you, and some little communion packets as well for those who may be coming from work or whatever and don't have communion ready. Uh, we have several ushers who are going to make it a smooth evening, socially distanced, wear your mask. So excited to hear Jeff and his friends, uh, Worth and Ara and uh, Heidi, I think is going to be playing the drums, uh, to be playing bluegrass music for us that evening. So it's going to be a safe evening, I think, and also a very joyful and worshipful one. And I hope to see you there uh, if you're comfortable and having an outdoor in-person worship, being part of that. I hope to see you there Wednesday night out back of the church. Then next Sunday, uh, we've always done uh, Blessing of the Backpacks. Well, this year we're doing Blessing of uh, Back to School for parents, teachers, and students. So if you are a parent, a student, or a teacher involved with online learning or if you're going in person school somewhere please drive by the church between 9 30 and um, noon and the church has a special back to school blessing to give you i do and also a gift you may sign up we're trying to do this in like 10 minute segments i think so on the website is sign up genius or if you're having trouble knowing how to sign up, please call the church office and Robin will help you. Thank you for your generosity once again in your giving to Leesburg Presbyterian Church uh, for our life and our ministry and our outreach. We very much appreciate this. Well, let's be in God's presence now as we begin to worship and our worship music today is led by Jeff Garnhart and Margie Lang Garnhart and Wynn Rogers. Our acolytes are the Kmitsky kids and we're so glad that they are helping with us and Heidi is our videographer today. And once again, our beautiful flowers from the garden of Kathy Brown. Let us worship God. Join me in the call to worship. The God of our ancestors calls us to worship. Praise the Lord. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Let us worship God. Yeah. 
It's a good thing to present our lives, ourselves, our whole beings before God and to acknowledge the ways that we are not all who God calls us to be and to admit that and to lay that before God. So join me in the prayer of confession. God of mercy, we confess that like the disciples, we set our minds not on divine things but on human things. Doubting your loving care, we grab for more than we need. Doubting your loving purposes, we shrink from living as your followers. Doubting your loving plan, we become stumbling blocks in your creation. Forgive us that we may gain new life in you, for it is in Jesus' forgiving name that we pray. Amen. Hear this good news. God's love is sure and steadfast, always providing a way out, a way through, a way back to God. Friends, rejoice in this good news of forgiveness. remember being surprised when the text for my college class intro to the Old Testament began not with the first book of the Bible Genesis but rather with the second book the book of Exodus the author of this classic textbook intro to the Old Testament by Bernard Anderson the author was clear and convincing that the pivotal foundational event in ancient Israel's life and faith was their liberation from bondage in Egypt. A thousand years after, ex after the exodus from Egypt and to the entrance into the promised land, it is the singular event most often remembered and extolled by both the psalmist and the prophets. Nothing, no event is more revelatory about the one invisible, moral, almighty God than this God's decision to free the Hebrews from bondage, to guide them through the wilderness, and to bring them to the land of promise, to be a people of the covenant and a light to the nations. And the book of Exodus introduces us to the most important figure of this Exodus event, and really the most important figure in the Old Testament, and that is Moses. Beginning last Sunday and continuing for the next several weeks, we will explore key moments in the Moses saga. Now the book of Genesis ends with Joseph in a coffin in Egypt. 
And Exodus begins with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who did not know Joseph. We're not sure how much time elapsed between the two references, but it seems likely that the story of Moses begins during the reign of Siti between 1230 and 1279 BCE, and that the exodus from Egypt takes place sometime after 1250 BCE in the reign of Ramses. As we learned last week, baby Moses in a basket was rescued from the river by Pharaoh's daughter. Then unknowingly, he was sent back to his birth mother uh, to be his wet nurse. And then at some time in his childhood, he was returned to Pharaoh's daughter to be raised as an adopted son of Egyptian royalty. Having learned about his Hebrew faith and identity, Moses as a young man was troubled to see the harsh conditions of his people. In a premeditated act of solidarity with his blood brothers, Moses kills an Egyptian taskmaster who was abusing a Hebrew slave. But Moses is rejected even by his own kinsmen. His attempt of liberation fails, and Moses flees Egypt as a fugitive. He ends up in Midian, intervenes one day when seven daughters of a Levite priest named Jethro are bullied when drawing water at a well for their father's sheep. The father is grateful, and Moses takes one of these daughters, Zipporah, to be his wife. And this is what happens next. Chapter 3, the book of Exodus, verses 1 through 15. Let us listen for God's word. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on the account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? 
What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my title for all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When God meets Moses, Moses is not really where he thinks he should be. In verse 22, Moses calls himself an alien residing in a foreign land. But then Moses has never been truly at home anywhere. Raised by his Hebrew mother, adopted later by an Egyptian princess, feeling the pain of his ancestral people, but not their support, Moses lands in Midian as a stranger. His life has been ruled by events outside of his control. And here Moses is in Midian, this former royal doing shepherd's work. Moses is out of place when he stepped onto a holy place. Insight one, God literally meets us where we are and not where we wish we would be. If we find ourselves with an unplanned landing at any juncture of our lives, God can and will meet us where we are. We are not always where we should or want to be, but God adapts to and accommodates us nevertheless. Now when God meets Moses, Moses, he's not at worship, he's at work. He's taken the sheep of his father-in-law far into the desert looking for pasture all the way to Mount Horeb. He doesn't yet know that Mount Horeb is the mountain of God and that Mount Horeb, also known by its other name, Mount Sinai, will be the place of other holy encounters with the one whom he is about to meet. On Horeb, there, there's no altar in sight. There's no cairn or pile of rocks. No marker indicated holy site. Moses is just walking along a typical patch of mid-eastern terrain of rock and scrub brushes, bushes. And as he's walking, he catches a side glance of something strange, a bush on fire. Moses could have shook his head. It must be the heat, an optical illusion, and kept on walking. But something made Moses stop what he was doing to turn around and face the bush all lit up. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. Barbara Brown Taylor describes the moment. What made Moses Moses was his willingness to turn aside. Wherever else he was supposed to be going and whatever else he was supposed to be doing, he decided it could wait a minute. He parked the sheep and left the narrow path in order to take a look at a marvelous sight. Insight two of this passage. Pay attention. Stop. Listen. Look. To be sure there will likely not be uh, a burning bush awaiting you, 
but there could be a powerful reminder of something that you need. A reminder of beauty, um, a sight of just unconditional love, a vision of goodness, a sound of sweetness. There will be moments on this earthly pilgrimage of ours that if we but pay attention, we will be humbled, we will be astounded, our souls will be quietened if we turn aside and listen and look. Take off your shoes, for you are standing on holy ground. Elizabeth Barrett Browning said something like, All the world is a fire with God, but only he or she who listens and sees takes off their shoes. The story of the liberation and forming of a people into a moral people of the covenant, it all begins with reverence. A couple of weeks ago, a few other Loudoun clergy, rabbis, and pastors, we met Pastor Michelle Thomas at the Belmont Slave Cemetery just off Route 7 and Belmont Ridge Road. I remember thinking that day that I had so much to do that I really could not afford the time uh, to go and to spend time at this cemetery this newly designated historical site. But I had foregone the opportunity at least a couple of other times, and I knew that I needed to go and also that I, I wanted to go. Perhaps it was the combination of Pastor Michelle's raw grief from losing her 17-year-old son Fitz in a drowning accident in the Potomac River just a couple of months ago. Perhaps it was that and then his newly dug grave next to those of his ancestors, enslaved Africans on the Belmont and Cotton Plantation, marked only by old field stones packing, poking out of the ground. All that and the reality that there were no names on these stones as there are names on the markers of our dead outside these sanctuary walls. All this combined, I felt like I was standing on holy ground. I felt sad, humbled, even shamed by something way, way bigger than me. While these enslaved men and women and children may remain unnamed, they are named by God. And while they may have been forgotten, thanks to the tenacious work of Pastor Michelle and those who've supported her work, now they are no longer forgotten. Reverence is at the very foundation of our Judeo-Christian faith. And should we lose the inclination to revere, to be awed and humbled by, to be touched and made contrite by the holy otherness of God, of holy love and holy goodness, then we will lose our way as the people of God. What happens next in our passage is the calling part of the narrative. Now, I want to read what I marked 15 years ago in my Anderson intro text, and I hope that um, you're as interested in what I'm about to read as I am in sharing it with you. I begin. At first, Moses, like most of us, wondered how a bush could burn without being consumed. 
But in this story, attention quickly shifts from seeing the bush to hearing God who speaks. The way God is described as speaking is clear evidence that the problem of the Hebrew slaves in Egypt lay deeply upon Moses' heart. It must be remembered that Moses had run away from Egypt after an indignant outburst of anger against a slave driver. So when God speaks to Moses, he speaks in the accents of history. His speech is a declaration of divine intention. I have seen the affliction of my people. I have heard their cry. I know their sufferings. I have come down to deliver them. I continue. According to the Mosaic faith, God is not aloof from the human scene of human travail and oppression. God takes part in human affairs to work out his purposes. In this narrative, we come to the very heart of Israel and Christianity's historic faith. According to some religions, man's highest aspiration is to be lifted above sense experience to immediate union with God. In such an ineffable experience, individuality fades away and the self, like a drop of water, is a great ocean. It's absorbed into the divine. But Anderson says, this is not the kind of mysticism with which the Old Testament deals. Moses' encounter with God sharpened his sense of individuality and made him more acutely conscious of the demands of the historical situation. That Bernard Anderson, doesn't he have a way with words? In this one foundational story at the beginning of the Jewish Christian faith is this partnering, this combining, this marriage between the mystical experience of reverence and awe, a take your sandals off kind of moment. It's partnered with a get out there and serve God's holy purposes, a put your sandals back on kind of moment. The story doesn't end with shoeless Moses. Wow, you know, far out. And Moses going back to shepherding, but more inspired or even chilled out. No, it ends with Moses putting his sandals back on and with his family going down to Egypt to be about God's work of liberating God's people. And in between the sandals off and the sandals on, Moses feels conflicted and inadequate to fulfill such a calling that God is placing on him. Listen again to Bernard Anderson. With profound religious insight, the narrative describes Moses' uneasiness about the call and the various protests he offered in an attempt to stay on the comfortable sidelines of history. Insight four, there is no standing on the comfortable sidelines for people of faith, for followers of Jesus Christ. Whatever is causing people to suffer in our world, wherever there is injustice in our world, in whatever circumstance there is not mercy, wherever there are hungry people, then God's people are always called to partner with God to do God's redeeming and healing work. But all this begins with reverence. Take off your shoes. 
for you are standing on holy ground. All honor and glory be given to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. to a time of prayer we have fabulous news a great joy uh, Joan Elliott was able to return home and to be with Bud in their home in Hamilton after weeks in the hospital and also in rehab uh, as in her words her voice is vibrant though she said her body is still quite weak and she is working on therapy at home to get stronger and stronger and she of course because of all that's going on in the world with COVID is receiving no visitors, but of course, cards are appreciated. But I just wanted to share with you this good news that Joan is back home. And a sadness this week, Linda McGraw, who is a, a visitor of the church, a member of Potomac Presbyterian Church, uh, passed away. Her husband called me, Mike. Uh, this week and she was at hospice 
in Aldi and at the Capital Caring Hospice Center and I went with her and she passed away a couple of days ago from really a, a long battle with cancer. So our prayers are with the McGraw family. Uh, Harry Marsh continues to be living his life under the care of hospice and uh, the Marsh family wanted me to say thank you very much for your concerns and your prayers. And we continue to think of Bev Miller, who is, uh, you know, struggling with her health during these days. So uh, let us now move into a time of prayer. Let us pray. Holy God of holy ground, we pray that today you meet us where we are and move into our lives. Change our minds or soften our hearts, direct our feet, even when we question our fitness to serve heaven's purposes on earth. Overcome our qualms with the assurance of your presence. Listening God, you heard the prayers of the Israelites. Hear now our prayers, both spoken and unspoken. Peace where there is no peace. For food where there is hunger. For hope, O oh Lord, where there is despair. For health where there is sickness. For faith where there is fear. For life where there is death, we pray, O oh God. And together let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And these are words from Paul in the 12th chapter of Romans. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. 
Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. And do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of God's Holy Spirit be with you and those who you love now and always. Amen. Awake, my soul, and with the sun, your daily stage of duty run. Change.